Hello everyone and welcome to the DeerCast. Uh, this is a slightly spontaneous uh, podcast. It is uh, just Harry and myself this evening. It is a, um, I was about to say wet and cold, but it is just a cold February evening. Um, and we're going to try and release this podcast for you in February. Um, so that's sort of still relevant. Um, and um, yeah, we just thought we'd sort of bring you a little sort of impromptu podcast, tell you what we've been up to um, and what's going on in our world uh, and some of the exciting things that we've got. Uh, coming up in due course. Absolutely, and hopefully you can hear us. Hear us, okay. We've had some some problems in previous episodes with all sorts of interruptions, um, dogs, rain, yeah, um, technical issues. So hopefully we we've ironed all that out. Yeah, we're seemingly completely professional now. Yeah, yeah. but there you go. Um, so I think probably some of the new stuff that we want to. Tell people what we've been up to the last few months. Have been some quite exciting things. Yeah, absolutely. We've um, a very exciting thing for both of us is taking on some new new stalking ground. Yeah, which has been been highly interesting. Always nice. It has been. It's been one that's been quite quite fruitful so far. It's um, one that uh, South Oxfordshire, uh, and probably the most exciting thing for me is it's not fallow, because. <laughs> I yeah, don't know. Me, but me too. This way through, this sort of far through the season, you kind of get to a point where you're just like, I've had enough of being messed around by mm-hmm. fallow that sometimes are there, sometimes not there. Whereas row, they're so boringly predictable that, mm-hmm. and I don't know, something about when like, extracting them, they're smaller, easier carcass to deal with. And then also you've got the excitement that you know when that bit's over, you've got the roebuck season coming up. Mm-hmm. I don't know, it's just been quite fun. I love a bit of rose talking. They're my home favourite deer. Yeah, yeah. I hate mine as well. They're magical. Way. They're yeah. like a magical little pixie. And obviously, and because they're my favourite, I never ever get to stalk them. Um, very rarely, anyway. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's been that's been really good fun. And like I say they're out. Well, these ones anyway. They're out during the middle of the day. Yeah. Which is so handy because you know you can go and do a fallow in the morning. Or yeah. Whatever, um, if you're lucky enough to do so, and then um, go and do a lunchtime row, and they're out. Yeah. Just sat in the middle of a field grazing away. Um, which is which is rather nice, and then chuck them in a row sack and yeah, no dragging and all that sort of no. stuff. So. And there's quite a healthy population of muntjac on the farm as well. So I yes. think each time, each time I've visited, I've at least come away with two in the bag. Yeah, there has been one session where I came away with nothing. Yeah, but otherwise I've always come away with at least two. Mm-hmm. One of which sometimes being a muntjac and the other being a row. Been good for us. Pretty good, pretty good statistics. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that's going to start to dwindle once the numbers start to get yeah. under control. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, to put it in context, when we were first sort of started stalking on the farm, it, you could look out in a field and see a group of like five row, who just quite happily stood there, one hundred fifty meters away, and they'd look back at you and be like, "So what?" Yeah. Whereas I think that will change as we start to nibble into the numbers. <laughs> well, we're into it. That's the thing. That's the di- another difference with row and fallow. Well, for us anyway, the fallow doesn't really seem to matter how many you shoot, they just keep coming back. Yeah. Whereas the row, once you've shot, once you've done, you know, taking a decent thinning out, they're pretty, you know, it's not, I, I guess they haven't got the range that fallow do, so you don't really see, um, you know, see big, big groups. But, no. Um, yeah. I mean, it, part of the context of this is that we've both found that the fallow tend to sort of disappear during, well, certainly during Christmas. Yeah. Um, that's happened here in Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire border for the last two or three seasons. Um, I think partly due to the shooting season, but I think partly because the ground that we stalk hasn't got an immense amount of, um, obviously during Christmas, January, February, hasn't got really got anything on the ground for them. And there's a lot of woodland around here with pretty good, you know, nice beech woods, lots of understory, lots of little shoots coming through, plenty of food for them. So why would they come out until basically just, you know, mm. crop scars start coming through in sort of spring, I guess. Um, so, yeah, we both found the fallow have been really tricky. Um, so having a bit of bit of ground with some easy row has been, been quite a nice change, to be honest. It's been really nice. Uh, really, really nice. Apart from one outing. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, God. Which <clears throat> I'm slight. well... Do you want to tell the boys and girls what, what happened, or do you want me to... I, yeah, I, I'm quite happy to admit admit my, my failings. Um, so, uh, took, uh, I think I've been to the farm a couple of times, either just me or me and someone else before you came. Yeah. 
and um, there's a collection of buildings and there's kind of an earth bund around the outside of the buildings and I always leave the car sort of tucked in behind the buildings and um, drove in, tucked in behind the buildings and I kind of crept up onto the earth bund, uh, looked over the top and was like, Harry, there are three row stood right out there, grab your rifle. So we both kind of really hastily got our kit on, um, as in stalking kit, not general kit, um, and um, climbed up to the top, top of the earth bank and uh, eyeing up these these three row, one was a buck and there were two does, so we were like, perfect, we'll each take a doe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I had my beautiful, lovely Merkel K3 kit plough. It, it is it's, beautiful. It is. It's got to make an appearance in every podcast, and I've just managed to get it into this one. <laughs> and um, I lined up on a doe on the left-hand side, Harry lines up on a doe on the right, right-hand right side, and we're like, three, two, one, pull the trigger, both guns go bang, all three deer jump up in the air, they all go sort of careering toward back towards the woodland, one of them drops, the other two don't, and they sort of go in, stand on inside the woods, sort of look back out, and then just sort of teeter off. Um, and we should say we're both, both shooting 308s. Yeah. I was shooting Barnes 110 grains. Mm-hmm. Home loads, and you are shooting 150 grain Fox. Yeah. So that's a bit of ballistic context. Yeah, which is probably. And what's the range? 100? 170 meters. 170. Oh, that's fair. Well, I thought it was. Yeah. Okay. And that, I mean, that that's probably for those of you that are sort of into your ballistics, you probably realised already what happened. But basically, Harry's one got absolutely clobbered and pretty much dropped on the edge of the woodland. And there was a nice big puff of. Uh, pins when the bullet hit it. Mine, unfortunately, um, appears to have made it away completely unscathed. And the next day, when we went and checked the rifle, because I was convinced uh, it must be off zero or something, basically figured out that at 170 meters, it's seven centimeters or mm-hmm. eight centimeters lower than it should be. <coughs> yeah. um, according to your, was that according to Strel loss or was that? No, that was physically measuring target. it on the target, yeah. Right, okay. And I, I knew it was, it's about 15 centimetres low at 200, but it's flat at 150. That's ridiculous. So, so over 50 yards, it drops 15 centimetres. Yeah. That's ridiculous. So I, I thought, I, and now thinking back on it in my own mind, a bit stupid, but I yeah. thought 170, it's basically still 150. Yeah. So it'll have dropped a bit, but not that much. But actually, you can 170 is basically halfway. Mm. So sort of is in between 150 and 200. So logically, it probably would have dropped half the distance, i.e. seven centimeters. And so, but it sailed straight underneath it, and that's. Um, it would explain. It would explain. Mm. It does explain it because we, we yeah. searched about for this deer for hours, thinking I, that it had been here. I got a bit obsessive. I'll be honest. Yeah. We then went out after this. We went out for a sort of to stalk around and have a look. And Tom just, Tom was his mind was elsewhere. Yeah, we had to okay, we keep going back and we went back and the thermals and we were looking yeah. in the woods and we spent a lot of time and we kept we kept finding hairs and thinking it was a carcass. Well, you, you're being very generous. I kept finding hairs and thinking they were my carcass, and I think you were standing there going, "It's definitely not your carcass." It's no, well, there was, there was one where I was convinced it was. Oh, really? But it was that. Weird, actually. It must have been where they've been couched up, but you could, I didn't realise that with the thermal, you can actually see the heat signatures from the deer couch. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's crazy, isn't you it? Pick it up. And it, it must, have, must have left there a good few minutes after yeah. I was there. It's ridiculous that you can see the, the heat signature. It's very cool. But um, I should say, I'm not... I, I suppose I got caught out because when I was first shooting... I've always shot a 308, and when I was first shooting, I was shooting 150 grain bullets, and... Uh, they were always dropping that sort of amount at 200 and I then went on to flatter, lighter bullets at 110s and 130s and 130s are what I use in my other rifle and they are genuinely flat out to 200 still and so I I guess I just kind of got out of the mindset of thinking well mm-hmm. I need to, need to hold over or adjust or whatever and um, yeah And are you, are you zeroed at 100 metres? I am which no. A number of people, and a number of people on this podcast are probably screaming at their phone or whatever they're listening to this through, going, we'll just adjust your rifle so it's an inch high at 100 or something. But I I like my rifle being bang on at 100 because I know what it's then going to do. If you know what I mean, like, say a deer walks out 100 metres, bang on 100 metres, I know I can just point at its head and go, bang, and I don't have to think, oh, is this going to be high or low? 
and less than 100, I don't ha- again, don't have to think. I don't have to think, is it going to be high, low, where am I going? It's just mm. bang on. See, I, I, I disagree because I think you have to think less if it's an inch or two high. Mm-mm. Because then all the way out to as far as you you really realistically shoot, you just point and shoot. You don't yeah. to think about it. Like, I agree. And my thinking is that in the in the if you're going for a head or neck shot, I would I would only really take a head or neck. Well, I only really take your neck shots, but I only take them when they're bang on, either facing full front on or facing yeah. full away. So any elevation difference, you either clobber it low or clobber it high, so you're yeah. fine. True. You know, that's that's the way I do it. But you sometimes do side on. Yeah. Occasionally. Yeah. I'm not confident enough to do that, I don't think. Yeah. It. I mean, the advantage to all of this is it's given me an excuse to buy a new toy. <laughs> because I... I as a range finder. I've got one of those. It's mm-hmm. in the binos. So you haven't got any excuse then? No. I, and I knew it was at 170 metres. I said it was just me being stupid. I just, in my mind, I was like, oh, it's basically still 150, so it'll basically still be flat. But of course it's not. Um, I have always, because I've always shot with a 308, and I've always shot with quite leapy bullets, I've always had a ballistic turret on every single one of my scopes, and I've always just adjusted for whatever the range was. And with the kit plow, I went for a fixed power Swarovski with no ballistic turret because I thought it just suited the rifle, like simple, classic scope. <clears throat> I think what I've realised is I need to change the 8x56 for a scope with a ballistic turret. Which is obviously sacrilege. Oh, I mean, I... it's it's double sacrilege for that rifle. You've taken You've taken its... It's sanctity away by putting a moderator on it. Yeah. In my view. I'll accept that. I mean, it's beautiful, don't get me wrong. And you have put a very uh, tasteful moderator, I should say, on it. Yeah. A small little fair and every whiskey bottle thing. Yeah. Very pretty. Um, to then put knobs and bells and whistles on it. But this is where I'm going to be quite careful. I'd like to escape this quite low, like ju- just an elevation ballistic turret. So it's not got a windage one as well. And quite a low profile ballistic turret, so not one of these like really big tactical big knobbly monsters. Jobs. Yeah. Okay. No like, laser on it. Yeah. No. And a night vision. Might you may as well. Yeah. <laughs> now I'll make the stock, paint the stock black. Yeah. Yeah. Just drill into it for a yeah. kind of spy pod. So I've been looking and it, it's interesting because I mean everyone's got an opinion on it, but I was looking at some Leica uh, scopes. I was looking at the Leica Ampla <clears throat> 6, which is like their entry model scope. Mm. And I don't know if you've come across um, our McCloyd and Sons gun shop. No. But basically I've been looking at... R. McCloyd? Yeah, I've been looking at one of their scopes. And R. McCloyd obviously know that I've been looking at it. Because <laughs> it's normally, I don't know, 1,400 quid. They've got a special deal on today. A today only? Well, I don't know. I think it says while stocks last. <laughs> So of course, like the child inside me is like, yeah, (laughs) child inside me like, what stocks last? Must get it now. Um, It's only a thousand quid. From what did you say, sixteen hundred? Yeah, fourteen hundred. Sorry, fourteen hundred. Yeah, that is a decent saving. That's a decent saving. So talk to me. It's it's variable power. Yeah. So it is uh, two and a half to fifteen by fifty six. That's a very nice mag range. In fairness, nice mag range. Schmitz for three to twelve. Yeah. So that's a lot of mag. B- ballistic turret, illuminated right. rest cool. Oh god! All right. Well, more could you? Ninety percent <coughs> light transmission. One of those big windage winders. No, it's not. So you can do, you know, you know those air rifle ones. That yeah. Have oh yeah. Wheel on the it. extended. Yeah. yeah. Extended wheel. It's got adjustable laser. parallax. I should say as well. Yeah. It's got everything. Infrared light. Yeah. Little turning peep sight, so you can shoot at ten yards. I know you're mocking me, Harry, but scope caps with the. With your writing on it, what's yeah. that? The calculation. Dope charts. Dope charts, that's it. Yeah. That sounds a bit weird. Um, I just I just don't agree. I'm a purist. Yeah. This is the difference. I'm I'm a purist. You're, I don't know what's opposite to a purist, but that's what you're. I, I suppose I am a bit, like, techy in that I just like stuff that just works and kind of, I don't know. <clears throat> but I can then, I can rely on it and it's quite sort of scientific, if you know what I mean. But you could eliminate all of this by just holding over. I mean, I could do, but... 
Where's the fun in that? <laughs> but I, I mean, in all seriousness, I I I slightly struggle yeah. in terms of say I'm looking at that deer at 175 meters, yeah, and I'm looking through my scope and I'm like, right, I need to hold over five centimeters, yeah. I'm not particularly good at going, oh, that's, I want to hit it there. So I think five centimetres is about that on the deer. So I probably need to aim about there. I think this is it. I think you're getting bogged down in the details. Like, I think I just, just trust my gut. Just, just aim, aim at the spine. Whatever feels about right. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you just feel. Yeah. I think The force. Yeah, the force. Yeah, yeah. I think I've gotten, because I grew up with a, really, a two two air rifle mm-hmm. using really heavy pallets. You see these like Bisley pallets, yeah. like the heaviest ones. But they were them with the green sticker on the top. Yeah, the green yeah, sticker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were when they hit when you hit something with them. They were they were destroyed, they were destructive. Yeah. But you constantly were going either over or below. So yeah. I got very used to holding up and up and down on my air rifle with rabbits and stuff like that. So I kind of I think I've carried that through, and that's now my philosophy. I've never da- I've never dialed. I've never found it particularly intuitive or easy. And a lot of the shooting I find I'm doing is quite snap. Yeah. And I'm already like, set the sticks up, put the fifth leg on, put your ear defenders on, you know, take your finger off your gloves so you've got your finger there, um, you know, to put the illumination. Like, it's just, it's so many steps. It just adds another one for me. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just not, I, yeah, it's more, it's more complication for me. But I, I do understand it because yeah. you, you're, you, you've come from like, you've done a lot of the target shooting and stuff, so you, that's how you've sort of learned. Yeah, to do it, you want to carry that, because I guess in that situation you would have gone, oh, it's one hundred and seventy meters. That's two and a half. Bang, yeah. straight in. And then, then you don't need to think. <clears throat> well, that sounds terrible. I I find I then don't need to think as much. I then mm. concentrate on actually taking the shot more because my mind isn't going, oh well, I want to hit it in the armpit. So I I think I'm one hundred and seventy five. So I think I need to aim here. So, right, I need to hold on this weird, mythical spot halfway up its body. Yeah. Whereas if I've adjusted it, I go, well, that's where I want to hit it, so that's where I put the crosshairs. Mm. I, I know that's slightly <coughs> kind of almost like autistic of me. Yeah. It's like, I need to just get it there. See, that's why zeroing at a, an inch above 100 is, is the best, yeah. because it, unless you're shooting over 200 metres, which I've done a handful of times my whole life, then you don't need to do anything. You just, yeah. Machine. So, there you go. one of the things you just mentioned there, one of your steps, is putting your ear defenders on. Hmm. Yeah, which, which is a temporary, a temporary thing. Yeah. So because come on, you're you're mocking me for about to spend a bit of money on a new scope, but you're about to spend the money on something else, aren't you? I am. I've been speaking to the lovely Mister Rupert Black all about um, a freer, freer endemic. Oh, you say it? Freer? Yeah. Free, freer and Devic moderator. Um, which I think it's the 159 one. It's basically the one that Sour sell with the rifle. Right. They obviously charge double because they've got a sour leg on it. But it's a Freer and Devic make them. But that makes it so much more valuable. Well, you would think so, wouldn't you? I guess it's people with more, maybe more money than sense. I don't know. I don't, I, for, for stuff like that, I kind of think that I, is a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Is it is it a, is it the featherweight uh, featherweight or ultimate silence three D? It's not that one. It's the okay. The ultimate. The I was tempted by the ultimate the the three D one because that's the one with all the titanium baffles. There's one four nine, which is the one I've got, and then one nine six, uh, or two six nine. One nine six. That's it. Sorry. Yeah. That's yeah. The one. Just like the middle of the range one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it looks really good. I mean, I, I was really, really keen on it, and then I saw, I saw some posts about it that made me think, oh, "Wow, it's on the stalking directory." You know, and you see, you know, th- see a thread and people bashing it, and you just think, "Oh no, I don't really want him to fall yeah. apart." But I think, in fairness, I can't really remember the situation, but I think they were putting quite a few rounds through it, and I'm just not going to be doing that. So I think it. I think Freer and Debbie are quite open that it is. A hunting mod, mm. and so therefore, if you want to go and blast yeah. twenty rounds in quick succession on the range, they're like, yeah. "This isn't for you." Yeah, yeah, which I think is the sort of is, point of the three D. Yeah, I don't even really like the name of that. The three D it just sounds a bit. Yeah, what's three D about it? I don't know. Anyone know? Right, right. Yeah, your three D. 
Um, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't pulled the trigger on it just yet. So if anyone, if you know, if anyone, well, I mean, the thing is, uh, no, I don't think I've ordered it necessarily yet. But that's what I'm probably going to get. Actually, by the time this comes out, I probably would have done. But yeah. if anyone has any really bright ideas, then. then <laughs> Phone in and make Harry feel really bad now yeah. that he's already bought no, it. Already and paid for it, probably bought it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So what, my, anyway, what, what is the lead in time? <clears throat> like how how long until it arrives? Uh, I think I should get it in. Yeah, by the end of Feb. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. So we're what then? second week of Feb, so a couple yeah. of weeks time. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's really good. Well, I thought so. Yeah. Because the, the the struggle I had was that some of the other mods I was looking at they they have to get proofed and things now, so yeah. that's like an extra month or two onto the. Lead in time, which is just a bit of a pain. So, um, yeah, but they look really nice, and your one is really lovely. Actually, yeah, um, I think they're well worth the money for you know, something that's going to last you ten years. Well, um, I was chatting to dear Rupert about moderators. Yes, because he rang me the other day about other bits and pieces, and I he mentioned that he thought you'd run up and ordered a mod, yeah. and I said, oh, and I mentioned all the crap that I'd heard on stalking direction. He was like. I've been doing this job long enough that he was like, I have seen every single different make or model of mod explode on someone. Mm. He was like, they, you, all you need is a tiny manufacturing defect in one or two somewhere or people mm. not to use them properly and like every, all of them will eventually go. Um, yeah, yeah. He, he said the biggest thing was cleaning. Mm. What? After people clean? Yeah. He said is in people not uh, not cleaning them properly or just not cleaning them full stop. And basically, once part of them starts to erode, you then got a weakness inside it that then, like, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. No, I put mine in the old um, in the old soapy water every now and then. But you've got to dry them out. That's, yeah, that's true. Don't shoot them where they wet. I quite like the frame trick because literally no no tools needed. You just twist it apart. Yeah. Spray it all down. You can replace I, the baffles, can't you? On it. I think so. Yeah. That's the thing I really like about the Wildcats. They're so modular, you can just whip it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that hopefully is on the way, which will make my life a lot easier because I can't actually use my new, lovely new 308 in a lot of places because it's so loud. I, um, I'm i so glad you're going to be getting a uh, yeah, moderator oh, because yeah. the number of times I've been Every out with time, you, me and I'm like, like oh, talking. fuck. I'm like, Tom, if you remember Druid Defenders? Oh, no, I'll be fine, don't worry. And then yeah. by the end of it, he's like, what? Sorry, did yeah. you build the Druid? So when I'm an old man and have absolutely no hearing, <laughs> yeah. I'll blame you. Yeah. Cheers. That's fair. I think it's quite fun to shoot a bit with that. But well, I, I may have said it on this podcast before. I think stuff dies quicker if yeah. you shoot it with a rifle with no mod. Yeah. There's just something about it. People, people in Scotland have said that to me. Have they? Yeah. One of the stalkers said it to me. It's like, yeah. They, they hate using moderators. Apparently the, um, the like, you know when you, when you shoot a rifle with a moderator, it goes like, tsh, Yeah. Apparently that noise travels further than the boom or something along those lines. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, as soon as someone with a mod has pulled the trigger, the whole hill is completely cleared. Everything just hits that and they're off. Whereas like the big boom, I don't know, yeah. they don't really know where it's come from. It doesn't really seem to bother them as much. Um, there must be someone listening to this podcast, full stop. Um, but there also must be someone listening to this podcast who know who understands more of the science behind it. If you yeah. can explain, we'd yeah. love to hear from you. You've, I've heard everything there is. Oh, they, oh! If you shoot them with the moderator, the deer don't know where they, where where you're shooting from. I've heard the opposite I, of that as well. I was going to say, I having shot how God knows how many deer with a moderated rifle is absolute bollocks. They always, as soon as you pull the trigger, all of them are just like, you're there. Really? I've, I've, yeah, I've never had a But have you been sitting in a high seat where they would have known where you were anyway? No, the only thing I was going to say is the only time is when sometimes the shot echoes. Yes. And then they're like, ah, yeah. don't yeah. have a clue where this has come from. Yeah, yeah. If you're like in a flat, sort of open landscape or whatever and you shoot yeah. a deer, generally all the others pretty, I think, pretty well know where you are. Well, it's funny because I was in a wood. I was shooting in a wood the other day from a high street that I never normally go in, and I shot a deer from it, no moderator, and the deer just started like running around the high seat as if yeah. like, they had no idea what was going on or where everything was. Well, I think that's because you've got a big boom that does then echo. But had it been like a moderated yeah, little crack, it, maybe. I think they would... maybe somebody knows. Yeah. Maybe there's someone who we could have on who could explain it. Yeah, that would be that'd be great. Send us your yeah. Send them, if, if you're a, if you're a man or woman that knows then. Texas in, yeah, or email or whatever. Um, 
So yeah, that's the next thing. And then I've got to think about a bipod. Now, actually, this would be really helpful if anyone has got some suggestions for a sour bipod that isn't going to cost me an absolute arm and leg, and I'm not going to have to drill into the stock. Then let me know. And you've got another requirement, and it's going to <coughs> remain on the rifle. Because I've, I've suggested you just get a Spartan bipod, but you've beaten well, that. Well, the problem with those, I find, is that I, I, like, I want to have a simple life. I don't want to have to carry around something else on my person. You know what I mean? I want to be able to pick the just, rifle up, it have yeah. everything on it. It's got the... You know, it's got the mod on it, it's got the, you know, I haven't got to, like, go into my pocket and dig out a bipod to then click it in. I want it just to be on the rifle. It's just there. get it on your, on your bino harness, like I've got, it's so oh, easy. I'd, just, I'd drop it, I'd break it, I'd lose it, I'd leave it at home, and then the one day I need it, it wouldn't be there, you know. Yeah. And I think part of it's the speed for me sometimes. I think it takes longer to take it out of your pocket, click it in. Oh, 100%, yeah. yeah then yeah. just look at flick, like, flick, flick. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. The other thing I kind of is a want more than a need, but I want it to go into the spigot thing on the end of the um, stock, you know. Okay. Because I think that is. So if you're looking for a really very cool. particular bipod. Yeah, I am. I'm really picky. Yeah. That's basically <laughs> my whole problem. Um, I really wanted to get a tier one, but they annoyingly don't make the adapter anymore to go in the spigot, um, which is really irritating because they make one. Called the oh I'm gonna forget the name of it now. They make they make one that like wraps around the barrel, which is really yeah. cool. So you can like you can be up in Scotland or on a hill or whatever, and it like you can auto level it. Yeah. So the legs go in, and then you can kind of I know you can do this on quite a few bipods, but it's like it has a really cool system where it kind of slides around on a rail, and it's, it's you know what will go really well with that. A laser, a torch, <laughs> night vision, a scope with ballistic tower. Oh wait. I need what I need is a, is a, spirit, with a spirit level. Yeah. So I can, you know, you have those mounts with the spirit level yeah. in it. That's what I need. Then you can level it. Is, is is your rifle not being level ever affected anything? In, well, I'm, yeah, well, I'm shooting thousand yard red stacks. Yeah. Thousand yard red stack. <laughs> then they won't know where the shot came from. <laughs> <laughs> You've literally like oh, looped no, it in. Yeah. You're like aiming at the moon with your holdover. No. <laughs> Then you'll come crying for a mystic like, turret. Those twenty MOA mounts on it. Yeah. See that that I mean in fairness, say you were trying to do that and you're trying to hold over, where like where would you even start? <laughs> yeah. In in fairness, hold over does have this limitation. Yeah, then you'd come crying for a ballistic very turret. Much, it's very much limited to stalking. It's not a target. Yeah. You know, yeah. You can do it with the target and stuff. Mm. Definitely not. Um, but no, I just never like ballistic turrets. Never been able to get on with them. Always forgot. No. Yeah, it's just it's like it's almost like having zoom on my scope. I kind of have a love hate relationship with that because I always forget what I leave it on, and then it's always on the wrong mag when I use it. And it's just another thing to zoom in around. Yeah, it's more things to fuck around with. Yeah. See, I, I, I am, I'm reluctant to move away from my eight by fifty six on the kit life because the the fixed power scope. I, I that's what I'd started stalking with. Yeah. And then I'd gone to variable power scopes, and now having gone back to a fixed power scope, I've sort of fallen in love with it again. And I quite enjoy it, because like you say, it is just, it's always ready. You get used to the size of stuff in the scope as well. Mm. Like you see something and you're like, that looks quite far away. Whereas if it's on variable power, you'd be like, well, maybe I just haven't got it wound up as high mm. as I normally would. Yeah, exactly. So I, it's such a nice scope as well. We do a, um, this is a bit of a teaser, but we've got a test yeah. you know, of some scopes i won't reveal which ones but we basically have tested them at dusk using a snellen chart, that's it yeah which if you've ever been to the optometrist or the opticians mm -hmm. you know you'll stand 10 minutes away from a thing with a load of letters on it and they'll say what does it you know how far can you get down so we basically used that as a test to see how clear they were at low light yeah and the, the best by a bit of a way was the fixed power Swarovski that from what the nineties? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's a two. Th it might be a two thousand. It might be a nineties. Yeah, but it. I got it second hand online for three hundred and fifty quid. I think. Yeah, and we were comparing it to scopes. We had one that was four five hundred quid. One that was a couple of thousand quid. Uh, sorry, one that was a thousand quid. Another one that was a thousand and a bit. One that was two thousand odd pounds. Yeah, and so. I thought quite impressive for a 300 odd quid scope. I was so it, impressed. Yeah. It's so clear. Such good light transmission, you know. It's just a great bit of care. I, ha I 
I did that really embarrassing thing where I actually emailed Swarovski and said, can you put a ballistic turret on my fixed power rate by 56? I basically just got an email back that was like, no. Because uh, if they could do that, that would be the dream. That would be really nice. Yeah. I'm also, I mean, this is going to really alienate some people out there. I don't like the Swarovski ballistic turret. The ballistic turret. What, what's wrong with it? it if, if you look at the top of it, it looks like a like torpedo hatch. On the top. It's huge. Is it? Yeah, it protrudes a long way. I don't think I've ever seen one. Well, uh, it, I mean, it, it's quite clever because it, it's clearly designed for hunters. Because instead of like dialing to a number, they've got little coloured sort of markers that you can um, dial to. And yes. so, say you know 100 metres is, or oh, sorry, 200 metres is yellow, you just dial to yellow. But it, oh, I haven't seen that one actually. Oh, may, one. Maybe I've just been completely smited. But if you see it on a scope, it, it looks like it stands proud by quite a long way like that yeah it just that looks quite nice big too. I think they all look quite big that's the thing for me whereas the I don't know the Leica one looks like quite low profile yeah no, fair enough yeah okay well yeah we'll have to see stay tuned to see what Tom chooses stay tuned to see whether I cave today and buy this scope or whether I end up it's buying stop, something else stops last they, can, they might not last very long I know <laughs> When we finish recording this, maybe you can come into the other room with my wife and um, you can help persuade her. This is a sound investment because it's only while stocks last. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. Okay. <laughs> You're on your own. Such moral support. <laughs> um, other exciting kit we've potentially got coming, though. Mm. Um, potentially, very generously, going to be grant funded to go out and buy a chiller. Yeah. Well, a or we already par- have partially grant funded. We've obviously each got sort of chillers, yeah. um, but they're like you know the standard, um, standard sort of. Um, well, I've got a Coke fridge that you can fit sort of maybe two, three, four at a real. Actually, no, I don't even had four in it, but three at a real push fallow, um, and you've got a small fridge. Yep. Just sort of normal. It's called a larder fridge, but it's basically a, a kind of fridge. normal domestic fridge. Right. But it's larder because it's full height, if you know what I mean. There's and there's no freezer oh, yeah. compartments. Oh, that, is that, that is apparently what delineates a um, larder fridge. Uh-huh. Apparently, so. full height. So it's not it's not what we would think of as a deer larder fridge. It's no. a domestic larder fridge. Okay. Well, yeah. anyway, we. Um, we basically hopefully getting some grant funding to buy some from Cool Game. So yeah, it's going to be quite exciting. Um, but they've got like the full rail system inside, nice little um, strip trays, yeah, proper temperature controls. Because um, mine's my current one's a bit of a Frankenstein that I've bodged together myself with fans and temperature probes and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it works. There have been a couple of times where it froze too far because it's completely constant. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, which was a bit of a problem, but I've, I've fixed that now. Did um, you defrost them and use them, or did you just bin them? I can, I can use them. They were, just <laughs> were they like how frozen are we talking? I mean, they 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 were like minus ten degrees. Oh my god! The freezer, the the chiller unit just went into overdrive. As yeah, as I can work out, they, they were literally <laughs> as frozen as I've ever seen anything. Yeah, they were like <laughs> frost on the outside. It's like they've been in, in like a sort of the end, There is one upside to that you can take some satisfaction from. Gone. You would have really, really nuked some keds and ticks and lice. That's true. Think, oh, of, yeah. think of the death oh, they had. In fairness, I think they survived that. They're, Do you? they're like they're like cockroaches, those things, aren't they? Well, you say that. Sometimes I find, and again, it'd be really interesting if someone knows why. If I hang a deer in the chiller, and it's got a few keds and ticks and all the rest of it on, they seem to all crawl out and go onto the gambrels. Oh. They crawl to the tops of the legs mm, and then go on to the gambrels. You just thought that would be the coldest bit. Well, I thought so. Um, I don't know whether they're just naturally programmed to crawl like upwards, if you know what I mean. If it starts getting cold, they just go... No, they go up they, to the light or something. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. And then I always find like basically once they're on there, they're dead, and I just brush them off. Interesting. Mm. Okay. Well, hopefully these, um, yeah, maybe these new new fridges will be better because they've got better air circulation. Yeah. That's my thinking. Yeah. That hopefully will make nicer carcasses. I'm trying to remember who makes the um, who makes them because Cool Game, I think, just import them. They're a German company. I can't remember exactly what they're called. It's really annoying. 
Um, oh, here you go, Landig actually makes them. Yeah. Um, but they look very, very smart, German engineering and things. So um, if we do end up getting those, we'll bring you a bit of a, a review once we've used them for a little yeah. bit. Um, so that's, that's quite exciting. Um, but other reviews and bits and pieces, because we've, I mean, it. I don't know, from the outside it might not seem like we've been up to a whole heap, but mm. actually I, I think we've been quite busy in content. terms of con- content creation yes. in the background. Yeah. Um, so we've got uh, a couple of scope reviews, mm-hmm. a kind of low light scope review that Harry hinted at earlier. Yep. We've got our big copper bullet comparison video, which might be out by the time people are listening to this. I, well, I would think so, yeah. Okay. So you may have already seen that. And really excitingly, one of Harry's friends who actually knows what he's doing with a camera and a computer um, has kind of filmed and edited it for us. So it looks... I think yeah. far better than anything we've ever produced before. It's very, very professional looking. So um, you have to tune in. It yeah. should hopefully it'll be up by the time we can release this, so we can point you directly to it. Yeah, go and check out our YouTube channel. Um, but effectively, we compare I think eight different non-toxic um, copper, copper rounds, something like that. Something else yeah, ridiculous. Um, and we shoot them into ballistics gel and then into water to basically test the expansion. Um, I think we found some really interesting things, actually. I think it was I a really it. useful test. Um, so, yeah, go and, go and check it out and see. I was, I was worried when we were, <clears throat> like, doing the video and of it that yeah. we weren't really discovering anything. Yeah. And it was only when we sat down at the end yeah. and we started talking it through that I then kind of it started to piece together in my mind. Maybe it's because it was quite a long day and I was quite tired, but it was only by that point that I was yeah. like, oh, actually, yeah. I, th- I think there's some useful take-homes for people in here. I think so. I, I think... I th- what I think is interesting about it is the fact that we're almost at the stage with copper ammunition where there's there's like maybe there's a good couple of different um, approaches to making a copper round. Mm. You know, which, yeah. Whereas like lead rounds, most people have the same general approach to making them. Yeah. In the sense of like you know you got the jacket and you got the linen side. Like there's not really a consensus. It doesn't seem with the manufacturers as to how to make a copper round. You know, you've got no. like the you got the like the like the barn stuff. I'm not going to give it too much away. But like the barns and the fox stuff is fairly similar because it's sort of no, uh, I'm not even are no. they? Because it like barns is built in such a way that it it it's sort of designed to come apart into petals. Yeah. Whereas the fox is made from just a softer metal, so it's designed yeah. to just mushroom. Mushroom. Yeah, yeah. Well, the barns, that, I guess, is similar to the Nielsen's. But they're then completely different to anything that's tin because that is just yeah. bizarre. But even, even like the Nielsen's, because they're they've got a me- like a plunger yeah. that like mechanically drives them open, whereas barns are kind of a mix almost in some ways between the two because they're soft enough that they just start to open. Yeah. But equally, they are machined, I suppose, similar to the Nielsen's in that they've got petals. Yeah, I, they're all pretty different. Yeah, really. it's an yeah. interesting thing, and they all behave quite differently. Um, yeah, which is really the, interesting. Sorry, well, I was just going to say I think they all do. They all achieve the same goal, but through very different ways, which yeah. I think is quite interesting. And I'm I'm sure if we come back to this, if we were to come back to this in five years' time, there'll probably be a consent like you know there'll there'll be a yeah. way that everyone's decided this is the best way to do it. But I think we're in quite an interesting yeah. impasse when no one really has settled on one way of making a bullet. I'm really glad you say that bit that they 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 basically all work in that I totally agree and having shot quite a lot of deer with different types of copper bullets. Yeah. They all they all kill. Yeah. Like some kill in different ways to others and some are again, depending on what you're after, in terms of some of them kill seem to kill quicker but are more devastating. Some seem to kill slower and you get a bit less carcass damage. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But they all they all do the job eventually if you get them in the right place. Which yeah. Is which is what you want from a, from yeah. a, from a copper bullet. And I think, you know, it's really heartening to, to know that because I think I feel like that isn't the case in the shotgun world. No. I feel like they're non they've got a much tougher job on their hands with the non toxic mm. stuff. I feel like for deer stalkers, you know, copper rounds they we know they work. They work mm. in a very similar way to lead and we're quite lucky in that respect. Yeah, that's if true. You, if you go out and if you want to go and shoot steel or superior steel or whatever, it's not like as good really from what I've, I've heard 
being said, I'm not really an expert. I need to go out and use. Stuff. I need to go out and kill a lot with my shotgun because I'm pretty sure I've got like a thousand cartridges of like lead sat yeah. in the cupboard, but I I haven't picked up my shotgun in anger for I don't know two years, three years, mm. and so I'm really worried that this band's just going to suddenly come in and I'm going to be sat there with. <laughs> I don't know, 300 quid's worth of cartridges that I'm just going to be like, oh. Well, there's going to have, there's going to be like a, an absolute dearth of people going out and just blatting lead into the yeah. other side if they bring it. I don't think it's going to, it's going to be like that. I thought, I thought they'd give you sort of like four years transition or something, wouldn't they? You've got to phase well, out, I, surely. Well, that's, you would have thought so, but equally with like rifle bullets, because mm. it was that, that sudden, I appreciate that wasn't, it wasn't legis- legislative, but yeah. all of a sudden the game dealers just seemed to wake up one night and, and they made some public announcement of, oh yeah, by the way, from the first of whenever, we'll only be taking non lead yeah. shot stuff. And you're like, oh. I guess they were game dealers, like once one of them says that they all kind of have to pile on board. Whereas if, if, if yeah. you were going to legislate, you could say, you could give a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Whereas if you're a game dealer, especially if you're not one of the big ones, you've kind of got to jump on the bandwagon. Yeah. And they're then beholden to their, who are they, they're supplying, if they're supplying waitrose or whatever. Yeah, they, they don't really have a lot of choice. Um, it's been interesting because all of our lists, all sorry, all, not all of our listeners, all of our guests, apart from maybe Justin, who was one of our first guests, yeah, I think are all using copper. Yep. Yeah. yeah, which which I think I think from memory. Yeah. Apologies if I got that wrong. Yeah. And it'd be interesting because one of our upcoming guests is Sam Thompson. Mm-hmm. Who's based? Who's based up in Scotland? I think he's been using copper for longer than um, before. It was cool. Yeah, yeah. I think he's one of the uh, the OGs. Early adopters. Um, oh, interesting. And so it'd be interesting to talk to him and see how he's seen it develop, but also what the market sort of drove him to do up in Scotland versus down. Because I think mm. again, all of our uh, maybe Peter Gibbon actually is Scottish, but otherwise, I was going to say all of our guests are all all been English, really. Haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Pretty much, apart from Jason. Oh yeah, and Jason Dino Teaser. Yeah, can we reveal that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason, Jason Doyle. I had Jason. Jason, uh, Jason on the podcast. So pretty already recorded. We've got Jason Doyle and Katie Hargreaves. I think haven't we? Mm-hmm. That's a, a that's a sport. That's a, an exclusive. That is. Yeah, yeah. Heard, heard, it, heard it here first. Yeah, only on the Deercast. <laughs> um, she will be a, she will be the next next person. I think we will be released. Yeah. So listen out for that. And then we've got one lined up with Sam Thompson, who I've already given the game away, and then also UK DTR. That's going to be super interesting. Yeah. Because you've got a dog. I'm looking to get a dog. Yeah. A deer dog. I want to hear I want to hear their tips and tricks. And I bet they've got some interesting stories to tell. Yeah. I bet they see some really interesting stuff when they go, go out on the uh, tracking jobs. I, so, yeah. I, I think it'd be interesting as well, because I, I asked them, because I did have to call them out a couple of years ago, um, and it'd be interesting to hear from them what their tips are in terms of you think you've shot something you're not sure what's happened mm. what's your next step because I think the temptation is always okay sling the rifle over your shoulder and just go blundering in basically because mm. it must be dead in there somewhere and I know when I had them out they was they said to me in some cases you do more harm than good by doing that like you're better off just holding back and going yeah, yeah. let's just play UK DTR and see what happens but you can't really do that, can you? Because, I mean, whenever I've done something like that, and I've found it, then I've always, I've always spent quite a lot of time blindly searching for it. I suppose it's where the advantage of thermal yeah. potentially comes in, doesn't it? Yeah, you could have you, to rear around. Yeah. Much. Yeah, that's true. I think once you've taken a dog through it, then you're pretty screwed, aren't you? Because that really yeah. does it all work. Yeah. If you've taken some random dog through it that doesn't really have any idea, you just think, oh, well, let's try it with a... You know, you're talking something. about my dog. No, no, no. I was I was talking about one time I took I took my parents' collie out just yeah. with the thought that oh it's a dog, it'll it'll find it. I don't know how, just through instinct, obviously and like wasn't interested. Your at poor all. dog probably thought that was the end. <laughs> like poor farm dog, like taken out get, to the woods. Yeah, taken out to the woods, <laughs> nine o'clock at night, Smells you're like carrying death. a rifle, it was like, Oh god, what have yeah, I done? That's true. Old collie. Bit, yeah. bit stiff. <laughs> she was not interested at all. She literally just get out there, look at you and go, I'm going home, see yeah. ya. And I ended up tripping over the deer. Oh, there you go. I literally fell over it. I never found it, but I just tripped over it. Bizarre. Yeah. Ridiculous. That's going to be really interesting. Really that cool be really interesting. Um, so, yeah. And then, oh, can we... Uh, 
Do you think we can reveal our sort of final teaser? Oh, I think we can, and it's a, it's a biggie. I think it's a biggie. It's very exciting. Do you, do you, you want know? to do the honours? So, in April yep. of this year, th- this year, 2023, in the marvellous county of Staffordshire, yep. there is a little show going on called The Stalking Show, mm-hmm. which Tom and I are big fans of. We went to last year for its first uh, sort of debut. Absolute triumph it was. Really, really good fun. I think we even did a little podcast review of it. We did. And, and when we did our end of year roundup, I yeah. said it was one of the highlights of my year. You did, yeah. yeah. And it was mine as well, actually. Really, really good fun. Um, so we've been in conversations with um, David Freer, who runs um, a story show, Foxy Freer, to those who know, um, who's guy, who's, I've been up with him a couple of times on Argyle. Great fun. Um, and... We are going to be on site, on the stalking show, doing a little um, podcast. We're not really sure what format that might take yet. So um, we, I think we're going to have like a little, by the sounds of things, a kind of VIP section yeah. where basically we might come and grab some people, take them away, do a kind of live podcast whilst we're there, yeah. and then chuck them back out. Exactly. Um, but we're also going to have David on the podcast mm. before the stalking show. Um, to, you know, I think David will be really really interesting actually he's a yeah. really interesting chat um, so it would be really good to hear his he loves his gear as well so that would be really good to quiz him yeah. stuff. Um, so we're going to have him him on the podcast I think in what we need, to, we need to set a date um, I think a couple of weeks time Blimey. yeah Blimey. Blimey. It's exciting. busy month exactly um, but that's going to be great and we're going to be there probably for both days um, yeah which will be which will be really good fun so that's coming up, which is very exciting. It's Keep, very exciting. Yeah, and then is, is like, we'll try and do the usual kind of like live videos and updates and stuff whilst we're there as well. And then, I don't know, hopefully bring you guys some content that might be usable afterwards in terms of like a podcast. You never know. Yeah, we could do some, we could clip together a load of, um, load of highlights. I think we'll get more usable stuff on the Saturday than we will the Sunday, knowing <laughs> what happened last year. Yes. Yeah, quite heavy, slightly sort of heavy evening, but yeah, yeah, that's what it's all about, exactly. So I think that basically ra- rounds rounds up the the podcast. To be honest, it probably does. Mm-hmm. I think that's yeah, quite a lot. Like I said, we I, when we kind of sat down to record this, we we're like, what the hell have we been up to? But actually, once you start thinking about it and jotting it down, you're yeah. like, actually, been quite busy, yeah. and there's been quite a lot of dairy based stuff going on. Exactly, we've got lots lots coming up. Exciting. Yeah, we've hopefully got a cull day coming up as well. That's yeah, exciting. we can talk about that a bit um, once that's once that's done. Some other stuff that we can't necessarily reveal yet, but we'll do on future podcasts to potentially film and do some reviews. Oh on yes, things, yeah, things yeah, like yeah. That. Um, you know, won't reveal. You know, can't reveal everything. Um, but no, we've got lots of lots of exciting things coming up. So do stay tuned. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, for listening. As always, please. Like, subscribe, follow in any way that you can, and yeah, send us in your suggestions, comment, feedback. Um, yeah, we will catch you on the next one.